It's recording. We'll recording? check it after the meeting. Okay. And is my microphone working? Can Watch folks it. online hear me? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call this September 17th meeting of the Finance and Personnel Committee to order. Uh, we do have a quorum present. We have seven out of seven people here, although Mr. Cooey's not in the room. I'm sure I'll be right back. Mr. Cooey. Uh, agenda item number two, proof of notification. Mr. Langrick, I'm sure there was proof of notification, correct? Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number three, agenda approval. We've got a 15 point agenda today. Motion by Brewer. Somebody else on the, I'm getting an echo. Might be Mr. C. Indeed. Um, Hear it? I'm on, I think I have my. It's Clinton. I'm getting an echo here. My apologies, I blamed you, and here it was our administrator. It was me. He wasn't muted. So I'm, I, I'm just hearing it. Okay, I think we're okay now. I'm not hearing the echo now. Okay, so we had a motion by Brewer to approve the agenda. Was there a second? It's okay, second by Turk. All those in favor of the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Okay, that motion carries. Agenda item number four, previous meeting minutes. I'm looking for a motion to approve those. Motion by Brewer. Second by Gentis. Any discussion on those minutes? All those in favor of approving them, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Okay, that motion carries. We have approved minutes. Agenda item number five, status and report on delinquent properties. This is under tax deed properties. Uh, so Supervisor Gentis had asked us at the last meeting under future agenda items to take a look at the status of these and Treasurer Keller was kind enough to uh, do that promptly and there's an attachment and I'll hand it off to her so that she can give us a brief walkthrough and then we can get any questions answered that folks have. Mr. Okay. Chair. Mr. Chair, this is Melissa. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Um, there's a number of people online who are not muted, and so I am hearing background noise. I don't know if you can hear it in the boardroom, but if we could ask people to please mute their phones and their computers, that would be awesome. Unfortunately, we have MIS here and they just muted everybody. But thanks for letting us know. Okay, Treasurer yes, Keller, feel free to go ahead. Breathing. Okay, um, can I introduce my replacement that's here first? Is that okay? That would be great. Thank you. Jeff is here, so he'll be taking over in a few weeks. The tax deed sales. Um, I had some, I had asked the clerk's office to run some reports, and they were kind enough to do that for me. And the totals that came out in those reports show um, the difference between the money we collected in sales and the money um, that was spent for expenses on these tax deeds for the last three years and then up through August 31st for 2021. Okay, so any questions on this? And, and I did ask the treasurer to produce this as well. Uh, since this isn't worked into our budget, we don't, we don't have um, tax deed sale revenues included in our budget. Those just go to the general fund. And then my understanding is with tax deed expenses, there are two lines listed there and one of them is budgeted and the other is not. That's correct. Uh, 28.5163, uh, we budget $3,000 for every year. And the other account number, there's nothing budgeted for that. Um, the first one, the 28 account number is expenses that I spend like for title report, um, postage for certified mailings that have to advertise or do share of service. Um, that's the preparing to take the tax deed. Those are those expenses that we budget for. And then after that, the other fund is after I turn it over to the clerk's office, um, they have to do the publishing for the sale and they have expenses um, for that. But um, I understand from Derek that that's more an in and out account 
he doesn't register for. I don't know. He could maybe explain that better for them. Okay, and let's see if there's any questions from the committee. If not, you can keep moving on to the is the stat. Oh, go ahead, yep, Mr. C. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a question for uh, Julie. You, Mr. Chair, mentioned that uh, tax revenue goes directly to the general fund and is not considered as revenue. Is that is that uh, how do you account for that? Um, can I can I take a try at restating what I think I said? Okay. So, what I think I said was tax deed revenue is not budgeted. It's not included in our budget. So it just sort of happens. There's no amount laid out. So and similar with expenses, but that would be for the. 10.5147 because 28 to your budget, and that's the one where you have 3,000 a year budgeted for your expenses related to tax deed properties. So, right, it's not really in the treasurer's budget, but it is a budgeted item. So it's just okay. a fluid situation. We don't know how much revenue is going to go into the budget or into the general fund, and we don't know how much expense there will be until the year passes. Is that right? That's correct. Uh -huh. We never know from year to year. So we did have a big year, but then we had some. So that's weeks. probably why, because it's so unpredictable. It's probably why it's not a why it doesn't go into the budget. Must be some reason for it. Okay, uh, if you could go ahead and move on to the status of of all those properties, gets to the heart of what Linda was looking for. Okay, I made it. Um, this is a list that we constantly keep up monitoring um, what part of the process the tax deed properties are at. Um, right now, we're very fortunate. We don't have any for sale. We've got all the properties sold that we have taken for tax deed. Um, we are awaiting um, some legal action to take care of the viewer's property on First Street. Um, that the city has already paid us for. They bought it for a dollar. And um, we're waiting to record the deed after the legal action to clear the three year redemption period is complete. Um, the two Malin Acres and the Niles property, those two properties, um, they've been hanging out there for some time. You can see that. Um, I at one time was waiting for a former court counsel to do an affidavit on that one, but we didn't get that, so we'll have to readdress that one. And then the other property in Richwood Township, um, we spent a lot of time sending out certifies and um, to family members that have not returned them, and we we tried previously to locate these people and have been unsuccessful, so we'll have to take further action for that. So these are just kind of ones that are a little harder to get done, but they have been out there a while. Then um, we're mailing out certified mailings to the next two. Um, so once we get those back, if everybody signs them and gets them back to us in a timely manner, then we wait 90 days and then we go from there. The only one that we did go Okay. And what are you waiting on for that? That one we just received back. Um, from court counsel, and we mailed out, we'll be mailing out certified letters to the people that were found on the title report. And then the only other one that we took tax deed to that, well, we didn't record the deed, obviously, but we went through the tax deed process on the Sylvan Creamery, but then was discovered that there's possible contamination. So, 
the county chose not to take it at that time. I don't know if down the road it's it's vacant land, but um, suggested that it was possible contamination on it, so it was decided not to take it. And then the other ones listed here. They are in the hands of the court counsel. I just gave it to him. So he'll be working on those as time allows. And then we have three more that I turned over to the title company that we are waiting for a title report from them. That's kind of the first step once we turn over if we have to request a title report from the title company. These different steps that we go through through the tax deed process and I try to keep a running list because you kind of get lost in the shuffle. Okay, any further questions? Yep, Supervisor Dentist. Um, my um, Seth, one is when top two, how fast do you actually have to take then if you never read them? Well, eventually, what the former court counsel used to do would be to publish them in the Observer and then also on our website publish the notification of application and then um I think we have to we have to publish it for two weeks um and then um if nothing happens then then um ben would always do an affidavit of due diligence which he would um write up as you know, due diligence as far as how he tried to contact people and Kind of telling the history of the steps we took to try to get a hold of people. And then I would um, turn it over to the clerk's office after that. Well, by state law, you can only be delinquent for two years, but you do allow people to take. That or we do allow people to make payments, and that's by statute. The, the statute does allow you to accept payments. We always ask for $100 a month. So for some of those that um, you may see are behind, and if they're making monthly payments, we don't start action on them. Um, we have some of these who get way behind, and when they get their final notice, they'll come in with a couple thousand dollars. So I'll stop, assuming they're still interested in it, and then maybe we won't see them again for a while. So each situation is is different. Um, but these for ones that you haven't heard from for a long time um, seem like they fall off the face of the earth, and we know that something. Okay, Mr. C. So for the treasurer. Has the village of Casanova fulfilled their end of the transaction with regard to the property in Casanova? Yes, that deed got recorded this week. Pardon? The deed did get recorded to the village this week. They were supposed to pay for the recording, I believe. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. The clerk came in and paid for it. Yep. And secondly, with regard to Delinquent tax payments. You mentioned that if they can make payments, that they can have an, they generally get an extension. Uh, can't it be dragged on for a number of years by that method of making minimal payments? Yes, it can be. Mm -hmm. Up to 10 years? Um, I suppose it could go on 10 years. Of um, we have certain people that pay $100 each month regularly, faithfully. Um, but then we've had several occasions where they do that for the first year. They kind of get caught up, and then they come and pay it off. Um, and we do, I mean, we get the interest on it, of course. But um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions, so thank, thanks again for putting this together for us. Very educational, as always, to 
keep learning how this tax deed process works. So, okay, agenda item number six, radio tower project, recommending resolution to the board regarding coverage, Mr. Linda. How about now? Yes. There we go. It, it's tough. It's a but not right there. Um, looking today for a motion to recommend uh, recommend pursuing a 95% portable and building radio coverage goal for the RFP, the request for proposal. Uh, and then with this, the resolution will show the county board's commitment to support the bonding needed for this project is what we're looking to accomplish today. Richland County Emergency Radio and Tower Infrastructure is aging, as we know, uh, have discussed. Uh, the components past uh, is our Pat's recommended lifespan. Radio tower system is also has significant dead spots due to topography and limitation of current equipment, limitation impact on our community uh, communication with patrol emergency response, firefighting partners, and overall jeopardizes public safety uh, when communications fail. Uh, the county is considering writing a request for proposal, not borrowing money at this time or, cons uh, or considering bids, simply deciding on the level of coverage that we want for our future radio coverage. We will be requesting qualified bidders to determine what will be required for the county to make that coverage become a reality. And again, that's the 95% coverage that we're looking for. The example that we have uh, seen proposed by True North Consulting LLC has some suggestions. It is by no means the final set of defined values. And that's the, the report that is attached with us in your packet or on the internet. Uh, for example, there's nothing stating that there will only be seven towers as the vendors that bid the system, uh, they'll have to decide the needs to be more or less to meet the 95-95 level of coverage that we're seeking for. There's also no brand or type of equipment being specified at this time. This is not the scope of, of the, uh, this is not the scope of the step we are currently taking. The true scope of this step is to define the coverage level that we're desiring to appears that could be our option three or the 99, uh, 95, 95% coverage. The three options were considered by the LAJC committee on August 18th with the option number three or the 95, 95 coverage selected unanimously decision by that committee. So, uh, and the reason we're bringing this forward to you folks though, is while we're not making a financial decision on how much it costs, because we don't know that that has to be proposed back to us from our contractors through a bid. Um, certainly there's an understanding that the increase in coverage equates with an increase in, in expenditures. Um, with this too, if this marches forward and we have a, a concurrence here of making a recommendation for a 95% coverage, the other part of it is understanding through this committee and through the county board that you are kind of, kind of putting yourself in an obligation to kind of continue on with the project and fund that project. Previous history, we, we correct me if I'm wrong, Director Scott, but we did issue out an RFP. We had bids that came back, decided that we could not pay for it. And then we kind of let it go. The concerns and fears are that is if we do the same type of a thing and we released an RFP, vendors come, they assess it, they invest a lot of time in engineering, put in a, a bid, and then we decide not to partake in the project again. It is going to be a very hard challenge for us down the road to do that for a third time. And uh, that is what I have for you today. Mr. Chair, I would defer uh, other questions to Director Scott. Thank you. Okay. Um, I. I got a couple of questions, but I just want to say, first of all, that I do intend to make a motion to table this after we get some questions answered until we get to agenda item number 11, because I think, I think what we're discussing here relates to our budget that we're uh, being asked to finalize today. But uh, a couple of questions. Mr. Chairman, before yes. you make a motion to table, would you allow us to ask you a question or two? Yes, with regard to your absolutely. Of tabling. Yeah, that's that's what I that's that was my intention. So, um, my question or one of my Mr. questions Mr. is, Chair? yes. Why don't I make a motion to move? Sounds good. And you can. Okay, go ahead. So I make that motion. Motion. I'll second the motion. Okay, second by seat. Okay, so. Um, option number one and option number two, it costs less, there's less green on the map. What is the percentage? I'm assuming there's 95% coverage with option number three. What's the percentage coverage with option two? What's the percentage coverage with option one? 
I'll actually defer Mike Day is on the line and he's a consultant that you chose to hire. So Mike, if you could speak to that question, please. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think if I, and you, I think you had it up just in that previous slide there too. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, Wait, go to you're the, asking, page, the next page. There. That's right, Clarist, I believe. No, step back. Maybe one of the earlier slides, I think, at the bottom. Oh. Yep, right there. Oops. You want to be on the current coverage slide? Is that correct, Mr. Day? Right, that one right there. Okay. Yeah, current All coverage right, slide. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's. Why don't you tell him how many slides you want him to move forward? No, I'm sorry. You had it right there. You had it correct. Current coverage slide right there at the bottom it represents kind of the, the overall um, understanding of the options as they're presented as far as um, street coverage and in building coverage. And so, um, as you see, uh, street coverage changes uh, minimally in the, in the various 3 options. Um, but you do reach the uh, in option two the ninety five percent street on the street coverage. This would be a a, a portable radio on the hip of a uh, of a radio user um, using a lapel mic. So um, and and then uh, assessing the the, the actual um, coverage or the actual uh, area of the county. So um, at at ninety five percent. And when we talk about um, coverage, ninety five percent coverage. Um, you know, radio radio signals shift a little bit, so it doesn't mean it, it'll always work in the same place. But it it's essentially designed that ninety that will cover ninety five percent of that area, and uh, and we use a factor um, a quality factor in public safety that basically states um, when an officer keys his radio at any given location, um, he will. If he does fail, he will move slightly and and likely um, get in. Um, so it's a very high standard as well. Um, so when you look at those numbers, um, it's a pretty pretty reliable um, coverage area. And then on the on the right hand side there, it does give you um, the in building coverage. So here again, um, when we when we talk about these in building coverages, portable radio on the hip. And then uh, in the structure itself, it's it's only um, kind of a residential grade structure. Um, you certainly will have much more challenges um, going into um, larger buildings such as schools and uh, and um, commercial buildings. Um, but uh, then always dependent on how close the tower is um, to you. But as far as the area of coverage in the county. You would have residential coverage um, in those percentages. Okay, so for on the street, option one is ninety percent coverage. Option two is ninety five percent, and option three is ninety seven percent. And then for in buildings, option one is sixty percent, option two is seventy percent, and option three is ninety five percent. That correct? Is that correct? Okay, thank you. And then when do we anticipate going to RFP? And then, I guess more importantly, when do we anticipate? Um, that we would need to, that the county board would need to bond in order to to get these money. So what's what's an estimate? I, I know you might not know the month and the year exactly, but what's an estimate? No, good good question. Yeah, normally um, an RFP development uh, process is anywhere from two to three months, um, and kind of uh, you know a general understanding of that. Um, you know, we we would look to. Uh, to get together with um, a group of uh, of the county's choosing, um, you know, three to seven individuals, maybe um, folks that have concern about uh, exactly what they're they're going to get, um, and and kind of work through a lot of these questions that uh, that we've uh, had, um, and a lot of you know the key points that we want to make sure that we cover. We want to we want to give the uh, the vendors an understanding of of the the uh, assets that the county has and and how those could be best used but uh, ultimately we want to we'll leave it up to them 
to to kind of uh, give their best uh, estimate and and use those assets appropriately. Um, but yeah, we put that together. Um, we developed the the RFP document. Um, we might uh, we might choose to put some options in there so that the county gets back the information that uh, allows you to make a decision, even if it's not uh, um, you know your first choice. Maybe there's your second choice sometimes. So we'll we'll have some options sometimes as well. Um, but uh, um, get that out on the street and uh, and and like I said. Uh, um, it, it, about a three month or two to two, probably two month process in your case, but ultimately sometimes um, purchasing departments can can uh, add a little time to that. So, and then how long after the the bids come back that that the county board would be asked to borrow the money? So get responses. You're going to give uh, you're going to give a vendor um, a good uh, thirty to forty five days in in the. Um, in the design of a, a system of this size um, to get to put together their response. And then you begin the evaluation process again, probably a, a 60 day process. Um, so just kind of looking at this year's timeline, if, if you, if you began work on this, uh, you know, within the month of September or at the beginning of October, um, you could maybe get it on the streets. You could maybe get some responses uh, by the uh, 1st of February. Uh, you're you're probably likely knowing what you want to do, um, say uh, late April or first of May next year, um, and and then at that point you're you're choosing a vendor and and then of course uh, sometimes there's contract negotiations there. Um, maybe there's a few things that uh, that you want to kind of uh, reorganized, but uh, the, that process is really takes on uh, your timeline. Okay, so it sounds like this the board would be asked to do this after the next election. So it'd be the next board. It wouldn't be the current board that would be asked to borrow the money. But we would be setting it in motion this current board. Okay. Any questions from other folks? And then just just one real quick thing. Um, so that that'll set your your radio vendor and and your radio contract. Um, we'll we'll likely at that time have some more um, clarity on your civil piece, but. Uh, Normally, a, uh, a radio contract with the signing of a radio contract is a down payment. I would put it anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Okay. Yeah, Mr. C. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the five percent uh, non coverage is that related to part to uh, topography? Yeah, likely um, topography. Um, again, these these designs that I chose are just based on um, my experience uh, trying to use uh, existing towers where I could. Um, just trying to give you an understanding, you know, what it would take to meet the 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 um, public safety standards in these categories. Um, but you know, uh, percentages can fluctuate. Um, Quite a bit based on just where you're at, and then even um, the design itself, uh, the antenna patterns um, that can be used, and and the uh, height on the tower. So a lot of a lot of factors can change um, a few percentage um, here and there. And then the 95 percent is is a county wide factor. That's correct. It it takes the uh, the software takes into account the area, um, the county border, and then uh, gives you a, an estimation um, of the percentage. We've had significant deficiencies in coverage in the past, especially in some of the deep valleys uh, that are girded by uh, high ridges. Bear Valley is one example. And other, uh, you know, the, you know, the geography and the topography of the county. And my question also is, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I think Mr. Langrick indicated that we have had a cost involved in previous uh, consultancies and RFPs. Is that correct, Mr. Langrick? Yes, it's my understanding that we had a, a previous RFP that 
incurred expenses that we put into it together. I don't know what those numbers are. Correct, Scott. I don't know if you have a full. Okay. Full impact. I actually, uh, the gentleman from Baycom is here as well, and I don't think it was a formal RFP. I wasn't directly involved when that happened. I think that they did research, and there were two companies that came forward with offerings from that meeting. Is what I remember. Is that correct? You have to come up to the yeah. microphone here, and but I don't think it was an official RFP that was released. Well, did we have a, a consultancy uh, expense in preparing the RFP? No, we never released an official RFP that I remember. But go ahead, Mike. So the the time frame for that RFP, do you recall when that was? How many years? What year was that? Um, I'm just taking a look here. I think it was like 2008, 2009. Right. So I wasn't part of that RFP process, so I really can't speak to uh, what that was. So, may I follow up? You still got the floor. Keep going. Thank you. So, what uh, expense have we? thus far on the present plans with our current expenses we've uh, we've contracted with true north consulting yes our our, our uh, expenses there as well as we have dedicated a lot of mis time time from sheriff's department time from administration office on investing into it as well as from our partners across the community whether it's ambulance service and sheriff firefighters ems so whether we pursue they prepare, they, uh, uh, you folks are preparing a, for an RFP, right? Yeah, is that right? You're preparing the RFP? True, True, yeah. True North will prepare yes. the RFP. We're True looking North. for sorry. Yeah. All right. And so just refresh me. What is, uh, what is the cost of this present contract with True North? We're at almost $46,000. $46,000 spent or committed to? Committed to and in process of spending. Is that contractual? Yes. All right. So uh, if we should not pursue this plan, it's uh, basically $43,000 that doesn't go to work for us. Is that right? Yes. Makes sense too. Okay, let's see if other folks have questions. Anyone else? One more question. Okay, well, just let's see if there's anyone else. And if not, oh, yep, sure. Mr. Turk, go ahead. Uh, not necessarily arguing in favor of any of the particular options, but just stating that waiting is not really an option. We are living on borrowed time with our existing system. Uh, we are using hand-me-down components that are difficult to get replacement parts for. Um, if we were to have a catastrophic failure in our emergency communication system because we continue to put things off, that would be really, really bad to say the least. Um, this is a, something that's been put off in the past and we really need to be moving forward with whichever option, but we really need to be moving forward. Okay, anyone else? All right, Mr. Seat, your last your last question. Well, yes, thank you. Uh, I don't want to be too narrative. But too late. It's a good reminder for all of us to make sure our phones are turned down. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. I make a pretty good straight man for you. That's what I was leading up to. Um, I, I, I think that I totally agree with Mr. Turk. We wait for us not to. Don, can you make sure you're talking into the mic online or something? Pardon? Make sure to talk into the mic. People oh. online are having a hard time hearing you. It would be uh, foolish for us not to continue with this after we've already made this investment. This is the second time around. David says the more we delay, the more expensive this is going to be, and the more problems we're going to have. 
with the current system. So I'm hopeful that the committee will support this. Okay, I'm going to make a motion to table this until agenda item number 11, sometime around thereabout. And maybe I'll go into a little more explanation about why I think we should table it until agenda item number 11 today. So how we will pay for this, I think is related to some of the decisions we're making about the 2022 budget, especially as it relates to Pine Valley and what accounts we are pulling from in order to make our budget balance for 2022. So that's that's why I'm arguing that I think we should table this until agenda item number 11 for today's meeting. Yes. Second, your table. Okay, second by Brewer. All those in favor of, of tabling it until then, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. no. Okay. Okay, it is tabled. So we'll go on to agenda item number. Seven, a report on unbudgeted expenditures, purchase of a mower, fairgrounds, incoming treasurer wages, administration, and data recovery sheriff's office. Mr. Langley. Mr. Chair, looking today for one motion and guidance on a second item. Uh, looking for a motion to accept report on administrator authorization for unbudgeted expenses regarding sheriff's office data recovery and incoming treasurer wages. Background on this item, several unforeseen expenditures, uh, expenditure needs, occurred and the administrator is authorized proceeding with funding the following projects. Number one, authorized incoming treasurer wages. The authorized or I authorized four weeks of wages and benefits for incoming county treasurer. Uh, this will allow the incoming treasurer even uh, to train under treasurer Keller in efforts to maintain office continuity. The expenditures will be placed against the treasurer's budget estimated impact of roughly $2,850.92 estimated. Second one, authorized contracted emergency services uh, to perform data recovery on the failed Buffalo computer server. Uh, the server houses data for the sheriff's body cameras as well as some GIS data. Uh, the administrator's authorized expenditure of $7,437.90 for the recovery. Invoices attached, again, this will go against the sheriff's office um, budget. Both of these are unbudgeted expenses, recommending that we place them against the budget. It may show an overage for them in 2021. Um, but to do a fund transfer uh, from a different fund of a contingency fund or from a general fund uh, then would cause an inflate to that general ledger number. So if we continue with uh, setting a percentage increase or de decrease based on their budget, they will have a uh, artificially inflated general ledger going into the following year. The one that I'm asking for guidance on is there's several type of options available. Um, this information from the fair committee. Fair committee would like to purchase a mower in lieu of leasing. Uh, to save funds in the future and have the equipment at our disposal uh, when needed for grounds to recover. Uh, since 2015, they've been leasing, paying $2,000 a year. Uh, in 2020, they paid $3,000. In 2021, uh, they, they purchased services from the highway department. I'd like to go back to, if we go back to leasing, the cost would be $3,500 for the season. We have only allotted a leasing cost for 2022 uh, in the current uh, budget submitted. Estimated expenses would be $14,000 for the purchase. Options before us today is there could be guidance if we want to do this as, again as an expenditure overage for 2021 uh, to re uh, underneath future items to budget it as such. If we want to do guidance to incorporate to the 2022 budget, that would be a under item number 11 to incorporate in the budget. If we want to consider this underneath an American Rescue Plan type of uh, funding expenditure as a revenue loss for the Iowa or for the fairgrounds, that could be another option. Um, but again, because I've got this kind of agenda as a report and I've not authorized this one directly, looking to see if you want this as a future agenda item for an overage expenditure, American Rescue Plan, or to uh, incorporate into the budget. Because this is over 14,000, it's outside of kind of my guidance underneath uh, county board rules and what I can authorize. But initial motion is looking for it uh, to accept the report on the authorizations for the unexpended budgetures, budgets uh, for the treasurer and sheriff's office, Mr. Chair. Okay, so let's get a motion to accept that report first, and then we can see if there's any questions on maybe items one and two, and then we could take number three separately. Move to accept. Okay, motion by seat. Second. Second by Turk. Let's um let's just discuss one and two. Are there any questions about one and two? 
He's just asking us to accept this report. No, that's number three. Let's just handle one and two first. Uh, the, the, the treasurer's wages and then the contracted services for sheriff's office for data recovery. Okay, any questions about those? In favor of accepting the report, please say aye. 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 Always say no. Okay, that motion carries. So now he's looking for some guidance from us on the mower issue. He's got three options before us. Option A, to talk about this at a future agenda, uh, as a future agenda item at a separate meeting. Option B is to wait until we discuss agenda item number 11, where we could make an amendment to change the 2022 budget. And option C, to incorporate into American Rescue Plan spending. And that would also be a future agenda item. So thoughts on the mower? Yeah. Yep, Ms. Okay. Gentis. So how much are we paying the highway department to mow the fairgrounds? That was 3,000, it was says. Yes. One, right? if, uh, if we go this back. is Carla, can I, can I speak to that? Go, go ahead. So this year, uh, I believe Josh is on there as well, but I believe we're spending around six, between six and seven thousand dollars for that um, service that we were provided from the highway department. I, I know it must cost money for the highway, but I'm questioning. We we're trying to have consolidated efforts here in the county. And they have the machinery. Now we're going to buy another machine. Should they be charging that much? Does that just cover gas and mileage or I, anyone on the highway committee? That we got Mr. Elder here and he's if, just coming. If I can up. speak to that, yeah. I believe the current contract that we have in place is only up to about 5,000 is what she's looking at having to pay the highway department. And that is basically for man hours and man hours alone, plus um, I think quarter hour on the pickup truck that he uses, but all the more time is basically donated. For that. So if we buy a motor, do we have more? Do we have to pay also man or woman power to run that mower the same amount? I mean, is this actually, actually, if we purchase a mower that's bigger than the one that's being used by the highway department. I believe the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I believe the time was cut down to about nine hours a week versus the 16 hours a week that it was taking with the standard um, mower that they have. We're also looking at buying a, a mower, um, Ms. Gentis, so that we can have additional attachments to it so that we can be able to do things that we need to out at the fairgrounds without having to go separately to lease additional pieces of equipment. Okay. Okay, anyone else? So I, I guess my thought on this is, it seems like this is a good potential capital project request. And it seems to me that this should go through the normal process that all other projects go through at the county and we shouldn't be shouldn't be doing these mid-year things unless it's an emergency. That's just my opinion. So, Mr. Brewer? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, tell me if I'm wrong, Clint, but haven't we already done this? Are we approving something that you've approved? No, we haven't. We have not purchased the mower yet. My understanding okay. was we have a mower that's on the ground right now, but that is a lease that we took out through Simpsons. Yep. Simpsons, thank you. We have one is, is that the more we want to purchase? Or no. We get a bigger one. We're we're looking at purchasing a new mower. The mower that we have right now that's leased through Simpsons is the same mower that we've been leasing since since 2015. Mm -hmm. So we've actually already technically paid for that mower from the lease that we've had from 15 to, to current. So we're looking at purchasing something separately. Um, from them or asking for, for bids and if they bring one forward, but it would be on a new mower. 
and something that would be able to have attachments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just check, Mr. Brewer. Did, did did you hear everything I interrupted? I interrupted. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, Mr. Seat, go ahead. Yeah, I wouldn't want to interrupt, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we recently purchased for Pine Valley a tractor mower with blades and front end loader. I think in the area, Mr. Brewer, of $25,000, might have been more. It's uh, brand new. They don't use it every day, and uh, it's it's certainly a possibility that they could share it with another department. The fair activity, the activity at the fairgrounds pretty much surrounds the fair, and uh, there certainly would not be year-round use for the tractor and more. Uh, of course, we'd use it in, in the summer months, and you would use use it, I'm sure, in conjunction with preparation for the fair. But it's going to sit in the shed most of the winter, except for maybe plowing snow, unless you have a contract with someone else to do that, which you probably do. But I think that it might be worthwhile, Mr. Chair, uh, to I have some conversation with the director of Pine Valley uh, and, uh, and their maintenance staff uh, in terms of its availability as well as the applicability, the size of it, and the utility of it for, for this activity here. We are in a financial crunch, and if we can save some money by sharing equipment, uh, and it is mutually satisfactory to both departments, it's a win-win. I would suggest that we consider exploring that and tabling this question until we receive information from Pine Valley regarding the feasibility of an ultimate project. Okay, it looks like Mr. Turk wants to speak up. Um, I could see several challenges with that, transporting it back and forth being one of them. If you only have two dry days in a week, whose lawn gets mowed? Um, those kinds of questions surrounding that. I, I tend to agree with the chair's suggestion that we look at this as a potential capital purchase and, and run it through that track of our budgeting process. Okay, Mr. Cooley? My only question is if the county if the highway department was mowing the lawn, why are we still leasing another mowing? Um, basically, with the current contract we had in place, that was for part-time summertime help, and each of our summertime help have reached their term limits of hours worked, so therefore the contract, you'd have to send an employee over getting paid twice the wage, so it wouldn't meet that contract specifications. My second question would be, is we already have mowers at the highway department, which is right up the road. Why don't we just drop the mower off there and pick it up when we need it? We have uh, two riding John Deere lawn mowers with 50 inch decks on them and they are not designed to do that kind of a property. That's why the hours were increased to 16 hours a week compared to the nine hours when we purchased that three point mower, which we had a lot of issues with that three point, it broke down quite often. Um, so if you put the mowers back over there with the John Deere, you're gonna, with the smaller John Deere's, you're gonna increase the time the mowing and manpower. So it's more than 16 hours? It'll turn into more than 16 hours, yes. What if we just leave the mower there and let Carla mow the yard? <laughs> or not necessarily Carla, but whoever, well, whoever's going to mow it if we buy a mower. Right. Just question. Mr. Yeah, Chief, Mr. Burke, right? We have Car may I ask Carla a question? Carla, you, you said a mower with attachments. Are you actually looking perhaps to buy a subcompact tractor that you can put a three-point mower on and maybe have a loader on it? That That's something that Josh had mentioned yesterday that I would need to 
talk with the committee about further, but I think that would be a great option just because there are so many other projects out there that need to be accomplished besides mowing that we would need something with additional attachments. Would, and and just to, to, to clarify, need to haul a skid steer over there frequently, right? And we do lease a skid steer right now from Simpsons as well. Um, and and that's fairly inexpensive, but that's something that we we should probably look at if we're going to buy the subcompact tractor that we were able to get those forks with it. Okay, I think I'll go ahead and make a motion to give guidance to the administrator to put this under consideration during the next capital project funding solicitation from department heads. I'll second. Okay, motion by myself, a second by Cooey. Any discussion on that motion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay, that motion carries. Thanks, Ms. Doudna and Mr. Elder, both being here today on that. Uh, this takes us to agenda item number eight, review of cash balance history and undesignated general funds. So I think that's Treasurer Keller again, at least for the cash balance history portion. Is that right? We have attachments, oh, many attachments. We have 8A, general fund balance, which you might want to skip. And then 8B, funds in LGIP, hoping you can explain that acronym. 8C, cash balance history, 8D, interest history, and 8E, sales tax history. So if you want to take 8B through 8E, Treasurer Keller, and then we can go back to the general fund balance after you do those. These are just the monthly updates, so I'll just ask if there's any questions on them. Could you walk us through 8D, the LGIP document? I may have asked you to prepare this. I, I can't remember. Local government investment pool. Okay, these are accounts that, um, as you can see, there's several. Um, the American Rescue Funds came in, and these are in a separate account at the local government investment pool. They are not in our cash balance. And we have our capital projects as well. Fund 75, those are the previous year's capital projects. And those funds again are in a separate fund at the pool. They are not in our cash balance. The other capital project, capital improvements for 2021. And those are also in a separate fund at the pool, not in our cash balance. It just seemed like um, there was some confusion one time regarding what all was in the cash balance, but these funds are not. They're set aside in a separate fund. As the good expenditures are made, they, um, we withdraw from these funds to pay the expenses that come out of there. Is, is Pine Valley's, um, the majority of Pine Valley's accounts, are they in the cash balance history? So they're 3.8 million general fund or $900,000 um, Capital Improvement Fund, their half million dollar debt service fund, are those all in the cash balance history? Not sure about the debt service. Um, what were the other one? The main one is in the cash balance. The, main the, one. the general fund one of them. Which I think, yeah, Mr. Rizlo just, I was going back and forth with him earlier in the week. So that four, almost 4 million is Pine Valley in there. And then those two other funds, I'm sure Mr. Well, we can get that answered later. But okay. any other questions for Treasurer Keller on this or any or other documents? Okay, then let's take a look at 8A. So I did contact Bill Moyleen, our auditor, 
in Johnson and Black and Viroqua and asked him if he could prepare for us a history of the general fund over the past 10 years so we could see what's happening with that. So I'm assuming, you know, to get from our cash balance history to our general funds, I, I think we're going to look at this at a future meeting. Hopefully, I think the clerk's working on this right now, um, among many other priorities. But Pine Valley is not in the general fund. The highway department is not in the general fund. So that's why we see such a reduction from the cash balance history down to the general fund. I'm sure there's other things that aren't in there as well. Um, but um, Mr. Moyleen, he was very gracious about this whole thing. I just asked him actually for the general fund dollar amounts, and he actually included the expenses that that um, are figured. There's that formula where we should have three months or 25% of our um, annual expenses. And I don't think that's all expenses. I think it's operating expenses. We should have that in our general fund balance. And that's that resolution that was passed back in 2015. Um, and so you can see back in 2011, we were at 26% of our fund balance or 26% of our expenditures we had in our balance. And then that drops, the lowest level was 12% in 2016. And then that has been rising up until 2019 and then 2020. And he made a special note to say that this is currently estimated, it's not final because they're still working on finalizing the audit, audit. we stayed at 29%. So we seem to have a leveling off in 2020. So any, any questions or thoughts on this? Okay, um, if not, I think we don't need any action on this, so we can just keep on moving down the agenda here. Okay, so agenda item number nine, amendment to relocation order regarding the airport improvement and drainage projects. Mr. Chair, looking today for a motion to recommend resolution of the Richland County Board to amend the relocation order in regards to the Tri-County Airport project. Um, the background of this is a resolution to issue a relocation order was adopted by Tri-County owners, which is Richland and Sauk County, allowing Jewel and Associates to continue with the appraisal and acquisition of rights to the proposed airport drainage project. During this process, it was realized that the proposed drainage ditch plat would need to be moved to utilize land with owners willing to grant easement or purchase. Uh, the, uh, the changes in the drainage ditch plat fall within the area captured by the multiple studies, uh, mainly the environmental study. The acquisition of land still must be completed prior to the grant application being submitted at the end of September here. Uh, please reference the revised plot and overlay diagram depicting the project. And again, this order does invoke part of chapter 32, which is a, a condemnation. But what we're doing is where the relocation order is designating this area as a drainage ditch. Then in your folder, then you'll see a re revision of the actual order. And then you'll also see a revised change in the plat. I can kind of show you in my pulls up here. I apologize, Mr. Chair, one second. So there's a slight uh, deviation in the plan here. This is the drainage ditch. If you look up on the on your screen here, this is the point of discharge, Air Creek. Um, we're now, uh, the original plan had kind of had this drainage ditch going a little bit north. Uh, that property owner was not interested in selling or granting easement, so uh, the design and plan has been reworked now. This drainage ditch discharge is now south on a different property owner's uh, line, and then rather running than running um, the initial plan here on the west side of 130, it's going to cut across and go down past J, run on the south side of J as the original plan over here to the airport. Mr. Chair. Okay, so. A motion would be in order to recommend a resolution to the county board to amend the relocation order. I'll make the motion. Motion by Brewer. I'll second. Second by Cooey. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. That motion carries. Okay, so that will be going forward to the county board. Agenda agenda item number 10, purchase of three new cardiac monitors ambulance service. 
I recommend that we take or that we uh, take no action on this one in this regard. I should have asked you to admit it on the agenda approval, but recommend no action today, Mr. Chair. Okay, sounds good. We'll move forward to agenda item number 11, finalization of the 2022 budget. Mr. Langrick, do you want to take this one? Uh, Mr. Chair, looking today, uh, before we just we get into a conversation and discussion, uh, looking for a initial motion to require that all committee member proposals to adjust the balance be balanced with all impacts to expenditures, offsets, uh, with adjustments to, uh, to funding sources and revenues. So essentially, as we talked about, this is going to be opportunity for the finance and personnel to make recommendations by motion, um, requesting that before we start that discussion, that we do entertain a motion to require that any types of proposals brought forward are in fact balanced with offsets. Uh, the finalized motion then today will be asking for is a motion to accept the finalized budget, potentially with amendments, direct administration and departments to make adjustments accordingly, direct the county clerk to make necessary public posting, present the Richland County Board for consideration and adoption at its October meeting. And um, I think you're attuned to the purpose of, of this item, Mr. Chair. Okay, so now a motion would be in order to require that all committee member proposals to adjust the budget be balanced today. I make a motion. Okay, motion by Cooley. I'll second the motion with a question. Second by seat. Go ahead. Mr. Langrick, does your statement mean that if there is an increase in revenue found, then one must find a place to spend it? If it's not going to be expended, then it would be stored someplace as a surplus revenue. So that would be an increase to a fund balance. So the mandate to find a place to spend it is, is not in effect. Is that right? No, it, 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 it has to be placed someplace. If you say I want to increase a revenue source, then it's either going to impact an expenditure. You're going to say that it, it's a revenue and it's going to be stored as a fund balance. Somewhere. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay, that motion carries. So now I think we can move forward to uh, consideration of amendments by committee members. Do any committee members want to make any amendments from the from the get go here? I know we have a another county board member who wants to speak up about something as well and. I want to give her a chance to do that, but want to check in with the committee first. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Of course, yeah. Supervisor Luck, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Langrick, I just I need some clarification um, on on line one hundred three point four. No, I'm sorry, one hundred three point three. Pine Valley increase from PV debt service fund. Can you just make sure I'm understanding it? Where it says in parentheses, preliminary is built with five hundred four nine hundred ninety six thousand. So does that mean that? Your preliminary budget wanted to take essentially all the money out of Pine Valley's debt service fund to cover our shortcomings in our budget. That is correct. There's five hundred and four thousand nine hundred ninety-six dollars of what is placed in what they're calling a, or what Tom has said is a debt service fund account that we're asking to take back for general fund uses. That's not a debt service fund that we're using to pay the bonding that is coming out of a different account. This is monies that are set aside on top of the contingency fund and on top of his capital improvement fund uh, to be used for that. Um, the reason that we're calling it a debt service fund uh, out at Pine Valley is when we built Pine Valley and worked through those contractors and those, um, those decisions were made, uh, part of the business plan showed that uh, monies could be brought back to the county to help with debt service. Um, we have not made a practice of that recently. The monies that we've been bringing back have not went to offset necessarily debt service, but in fact been used towards um, other operational expenses. Yes, the preliminary is built already with uh, with asking for the full five hundred and four thousand nine hundred ninety six dollars to return back. So that that depletes that count account completely. No. Uh, let, yes, let, that, let that's, Mr. Langrad that's, answer the question. It, it it depletes what is budgeted for. That doesn't mean that that's how much it's going to arrive at at the end of the year based on the different market impacts that uh, Tom and the folks at Pine Valley might have. Did that answer your question? Yeah, is this the same? So last year when 
when Pine Valley gave money back to us to use for operations, is this the same account that we used last year to help close the gap in our budget? I don't, I don't think Tom, uh, Tom shaking his head. I don't think they were quite structured uh, like that out there where they had it. I think they were operating out of one account, um, working through the budget planning for this year. Tom is, in my opinion, done a great job of, of establishing a contingency fund for contingent operations. The second one for capital improvements, um, that they're not coming to ask us for future expenses. They're going to start um, saving their own. And then beyond that, then of having this debt service fund of additional funds then that could be uh, requested back by the county to use for their debt service pay down or as it's proposed towards uh, operations. Does that answer your right. question? So, yeah. So, I mean, my, I guess my comment is that in theory, we could have used this money or to pay down debt so that when we do borrow, if assuming we borrow for the radio tower project, the tax impact on our citizens wouldn't be as great. Is that accurate? Yes, it can be used for that. Um, if we're not going to use it though to offset $500 and other operational expenses, we will have to find other resources for those expenses or to reduce those uh, service and expenditures entirely. Right, I mean, it's it's a huge number, so it would have huge impacts if we do not use this money. Yeah, I think to piggyback on what is being discussed here, I did not realize until early this week that we were doing that. I probably missed it in a previous meeting. When I was making the comment last at our last meeting that the administrator's recommended budget is spending down our savings, um, in the contingency fund, it's taking 300 grand out of there. It's also taking nearly 100 grand out of the general fund. I didn't realize it was also taking 500 grand out of the Pine Valley Debt Service Fund. And, but it makes sense now because I was wondering where are we getting all this money to give wa wage increases, to add staff, to deal with a 16% increase in health insurance costs. So it was really, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks if that's where it's coming from. And that radio tower project is, I think is extremely important. And I just don't, personally, I don't feel like that's a responsible thing to do is to ask the next board to add another $7 million on the 26 million we already have borrowed. You know, that would take us up to, I, I don't know, 60% of our debt capacity. So I was I was personally hoping that we could use the debt service fund and have an expectation from Pine Valley that they would be setting aside perhaps 650 grand a year that could then be applied to the radio tower project so that we could we could reduce the tax increase on on residents. So I, I just got to say too, you know, I, I, we're not going to get into amendments right away, is that I just think, me personally, I don't think, well, first of all, starting with the good stuff, this is so transparent. I've never been able to see what we, what we're doing so far in advance and to really know what I'm voting yes or no to. I think in the past, I just didn't know what I was voting on on October 27th or whenever the meeting was at the county board. So this is so great. I, I really feel like I, if I have questions. I'm getting them answered by multiple staff. It's, it's very clear what's going on. I mean, not perfectly clear, but I do think that we haven't balanced our priorities. I think the main way we're getting through this next budget year is we are spending down our savings accounts. And I don't think that's balanced with other, we're not spreading around the pain. It's all going to our savings account. And I just don't think that's fair to the next board, whoever's gonna be on that next board. I don't even know if I'm gonna be on the next board. And I just don't think it's fair to kick the can down the road or to say that the strategic planning committee has to come up with all the ideas for cuts. I think we've got it. Me personally, I think we have to do more. So assuming this budget just stays as is, I'm not going to support it. 
I think it's, I think it, we got our priorities off. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, Mr. C. I'd like to add a dimension to Mr. Linebrook's uh, statement reference to $500,000 uh, from Pine Valley, kind of in response to uh, Melissa's question. And secondly, I'd like to offer a statement of reassurance to you. Uh, one, Pine Valley has done a tremendous job. Mr. Brewer and I serve as trustees on the, on the Pine Valley entity. And uh, they have a very sound financial plan developed uh, with staff, worked with our auditor, and they have established a plan whereby they, with discipline, the goal of maintaining as the auditor recommends, a three month cash balance to pay the operating expense. That's uh, their first priority. And the second priority is to maintain a capital expenditure reserve fund, uh, knowing that in possibly 15 years, my uh, Valley is close to five years old, they may have to replace a roof, which in today's prices may be a half a million, 400,000 to a half a million dollars. They're wisely planning for that and they're setting aside $50,000 a year uh, for that forthcoming capital expenditure which otherwise would force the county 15 years from now to borrow the money on a bond perhaps. And 15 years from now, that four or $500,000, the rate of inflation could be $800,000. So once those two priorities have been established, funds in excess of that all the debt service fund it's available this year is five hundred and seven thousand dollars to the county without without uh, jeopardizing those other two priorities the operating reserve for three months the cash balance and the capital expenditures uh, reserve they've done a very wise uh, thing here and Mr. Rislow is uh, very much to be complimented. He worked very closely with our administrator in developing this plan. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a good thing for the county. We cannot always look at Pine Valley as a, a gold a pot of gold. They have uh, their challenges as well especially uh, they're dependent upon a consistent census rate. With the COVID uh, epidemic, their uh, residency occupancy has dropped from uh, their goal of 90% down to about 68%. That cost a hell of a lot of money to Pine Valley, especially if it's in the uh, assisted living sector. In addition to that, the dependency upon Medicare and Medicaid are very fluid and unpredictable funding sources. So we need to be appreciative of it as a funding source for now, but Let's not look at Pine Valley and say, hey, they got a hell of a lot of money down there. They don't. They have very wise financial planning. And uh, so you should be reassured, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I think we've made great progress here in the last several years. We were in a bind, uh, but from 
a 16% reserve to 29% reserve is remarkable given the challenges we've had. The success financially of our, of our very stable, I think, financial situation has a lot to do with the leadership uh, as well as uh, excellent cooperation from our department heads and with good budget management. However, our employees have sacrificed for us. Our employees are our most valuable resource in the county. And they have sacrificed over these years with wages frozen, increased insurance costs, increased deductibles, given them raises and taking it away on the other end with insurance costs. They have been remarkable. We have some of the best employees of any institution that I know of. Very fine, dedicated people. And they get credit for our progress. You should be proud of the job that you've done here as chair as well. You've done an excellent job. You've shown excellent leadership. I don't always agree with you when you say no uh, or when you vote no, but we can disagree as we all do without being disagreeable. So I thank you for what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Supervisor Gentis. Uh, that increase that six, and I thought that was paid for by Medicaid funds, and it looks like we're not going to do that. And I thought that was a balancing out that wouldn't affect the budget. That's my one question, and see if I mean that right. And I guess my second question is to you, John. We have the seven percent increase and the sixteen percent increase. I'm looking through here last night and the night before where we can make other cuts and to vote a blank no at this point. I think you need to come up with some suggestions of where you're going to make the cuts rather than just straight across no because that seems like you're being political rather than just actually the problem. Okay. And so I have those two questions. Okay, let's let uh, Mr. Langrick and Mr. Rizlo answer the first one, then I can answer the second one. Sure. So on line um, 22 1, we have on there a proposed of what the increase was to allow it to move to the step six increase. Um, it's not actioned as a change, so it's built right now with it being in there. So the uh, red it's, means it's, it's still in? The, the column here says if this is a fill for you. If you, if you wanted to say, okay, no, we're not going to do that. It's approximately $119 and, or $119,600 less in expenditures out there. And now again, though, you'd have to be asking for that to come back to the general fund because as a, propri as a proprietary fund, uh, he's incorporating that into his expenses. But if you wanted to say, well, we still want to increase the added Medicaid uh, dollars and this federal dollars and such, you want to have that come to us and then and, but not do the increases for it and have an additional $119,600 that come back to the general fund for operations. That's why it's queued, it's queued in there. It's not uh, put in the final column as a recommendation, but it's put in there as a potential type of a fill that could be exercised. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so those are option cuts. Yes, yes. So um, just to, to, to make sure we're all on the same base. So when you're coming across, Supervisor Linda, yeah. uh, Gentis, when you're, when you're seeing them come across, the, the, the yeah. black ones that are on that first column yeah. are added expenses. And then the second ones in that red column are additional types of, uh, of gap fills or, or savings. And then the final columns are the ones that I'm recommending that we initiate uh, as either a added expense or a, a added reduction. So that's not in the final column. That's why I'm confused. Correct. It's it's built into the budget right now to have it in there. What what this is saying is that if you don't want to allow that increase of that amount for next year, yes, then you say we're not doing the increase, we're pulling it back. So does that make sense? Okay. 
Okay, so and I think your your question about why don't you propose some ways to actually sort this out? Um, did think about that quite a bit this week as I was juggling the rest of my life, and I decided that it might. Do I say it? I don't want to waste people's time. Um, I don't think what I personally would do would be acceptable to the to the finance and personnel committee. So personally, and what I think I would do is I think I would take some out of savings. I wouldn't take nearly as much, but then I think I would spread the rest of it around. So I, I would think of maybe about three different buckets. Um, one bucket being we're increasing FTEs by 2.1. So I just don't think as a county we can lose 4% of our population and then simultaneously increase the staff at the county. So I think I would look for different spots. I don't think I would just go after small departments or big departments, and I don't think I would do across the board. I think it'd be a more surgical approach. Um, the second bucket would be health insurance. I think 16% is a lot to swallow for any organization. I wouldn't want to put a lot on the employees, but maybe just a little bit of that. Um, and then third bucket, I think, is the discretionary expenses. So we've already taken 10 grand from UW Richland, 10 grand from the parks, five grand from the well study. I think I would look at other discretionary services like an example would be Simon's, reducing the amount we're giving to them. So I think that's how I would approach it. If it was me, I'd try to spread the pain around so it wasn't all on our savings and it didn't affect the next board so much. And I'd love to get that radio tower project funded without increasing taxes beyond the rate of inflation for, for our tax payers. I think there are some places. I agree there are some places I would make cuts. Okay, well, if no one's jumping in, it might be a good segue for uh, Supervisor Glassbrun and Ingrid Glassbrunner is here. Do you want to come up to a microphone? And, and um, I know you wanted to speak about, about something related to this, the budget. Okay, hi, I'm Supervisor Glassbrenner. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Health and Human Services Board um, in place of our Chair Severson, who wasn't able to be here today. I wanted to address one of the um, line items you can see here. I think it's 1.1, where it um, has as an add-in implement new drug court program. And I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about our Health and Human Services Board's position on this. Um, and why we feel that this should be a part of the budget. And then I know that Director Thorson is online and she can speak to her plan for how we would offset that cost of $15,000. So background, and you guys maybe already know this, um, Richland County has been operating a sobriety court for the last five years um, through some grant funding. And it's on a five year cycle. So we're on the last year of that and this coming year 2022 would be the year that we need to apply for that grant again, but we would like to um, pursue additional grant funding that would enable us to not only have a sobriety court, but also a drug treatment court. Currently, our sobriety court is um, serving those under alcohol um, related offenses and drug court would increase that to some um, drug related as well. They are not able to be combined, it would have to be separate, but the funding that we're pursuing is, I believe, and Director Thorson can um, correct me if I'm wrong, but $150,000 um, in additional funding. And the reason why we're bringing this forward now is because we would have to apply now for that funding and we would need to have $15,000 in order to get that. Um, 
we believe that that's very valuable. We had various key players in that come and speak to us too on that, as well as um, Judge Sharp, the district attorney. Um, we've seen a lot of really good things with our sobriety court and believe that we have a need here in the county to also expand that to drug treatment court. Um, and like I said, Director Thorson is here to, she can answer some questions and present what her plan was for offsetting that cost. Thank you, Supervisor Glassbrenner. Um, Mr. Chair, is it all right if I go ahead and share? Absolutely, absolutely. go ahead. So a uh, strategy that I would recommend for funding drug court would be to uh, reduce the additional tax levy that uh, is being recommended for the placement funds, that additional 490,381, uh, reducing that by $15,000 in in order to provide the needed funds for implementing the drug treatment court uh, under the TAD grant or treatment alternatives diversion grant. Um, I would say that the rationale for taking tax levy from the placement funds is that the more mental health and substance abuse services and interventions that we have available in the community, the greater chance we have uh, to reduce the need for institutional and other placements. Uh, by having an effective drug court in Richland County, it will likely have an impact on reducing some of those drug-related emergency hospitalizations that end up in Winnebago. So that would be the strategy that I would recommend uh, to come up with that $15,000 in tax levy. And although you can't say that there the uh, guaranteed dollar for dollar savings, it seems that it would have a positive impact on placements. And so it seems logical to look to those placement funds to help with that. Okay, so it would, uh, I just wanna make it clear, it would have to be a member of this committee who would make the motion to um, add 15,000 into drug court, reduce 15,000 from placement, uh, institutional placement fund. So if, is there anyone who wants to make that motion or should we just get into discussion? Mr. Chairman. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Seat. I, I'm pleased to make that motion. Okay, motion by Seat. I'll try that. Second by Brewer, any discussion on that motion to amend? Mr. Seat. I want to commend Ingrid for her very cogent presentation. Uh, I appreciate it very much, and I'm very pleased. Uh, this is a program that is greatly needed in the county. We have a tremendous problem with uh, opioid addiction, as well as uh, opioid epidemic, as well as a lot of problems with with alcohol. This is a court system, and uh, I wanted to ask you: Is the uh, the drug court and the alcohol court, is that uh, connected to the, the counseling and rehab uh, sector? Um, so Director Thorson may be able to answer this better, but it's my understanding, at least so far with what we've had for sobriety court, um, it provides some alternatives. There's criteria that have to be met in order to be able to um, be considered for this program if you have an alcohol or a drug related offense. But then um, there's treatment and counseling that happens with that as well as monitoring. Is that correct, Tracy? Yes, that's correct. So both uh, the participants appear before the judge, I believe on a weekly basis or at least uh, every other week in front of the judge uh, where they monitor progress uh, as a team between the, the judge the uh, district attorney, the defense attorney, the probation agent, and then the drug treatment coordinator. Uh, and there's also a, a treatment uh, member of the staff. And so it, just as Supervisor Glassbrenner said, it's a combination of monitoring drug testing and um, treatment services that are provided to, that makes that successful. And may I ask one more question, Mr. Chairman? Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, uh, is there a matching funds requirement here? 
Yes, there are. Uh, so as uh, there's a 25% match requirement to receive the TAD grant funding. Um, we are currently uh, have, I think maybe around $7,000 of tax levy for the sobriety court as a match for the funding that we are receiving. And then we're also able to use in kind match for some of the other staff time, like the sheriff's department participation. Uh, we're not able to use any match for state employees, but any of our county employees who participate in the drug court in some way, we are able to match the salary time for them. And so by uh, adding a drug court, we've kind of maxed out the staff time because there will be some overlap. Many of the same staff will be involved. Uh, and that's the reason for needing the 15,000 um, as the match that we would use for drug court funding. Well, I thank you both for this presentation. It's greatly needed and, and I certainly appreciate your diligence in bringing this forward. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, Mr. Cui. My only thing is, is we never budget enough money for placements. So we're just, I mean, basically, why don't we just add the $15,000 to this budget? Because you take it out of the placement cost, we're going to, at the end of the year, we just end up paying that anyway. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think Mr. Cooley is brilliant, but we just passed a motion at the beginning of this that a department had who brings forth a proposal or an amendment to the budget is to find a, a way to spend it or a, a way to replace it. Yeah, but there's no guarantee that you're going to take. Okay, so then we're not going to pay more than 400 and whatever that number is, 75,000 next year. We're guaranteeing that we're not going to do that, mm -hmm. right? Mr. Chapman. Um, no, no, I, I think this is just the amount that is being budgeted. Um, oftentimes departments do go over or under their budgets and we haven't had a chance to review those yet for last year, but those would be in the deficiency report. So um, I'm assuming the reason why, part of the reason why we got an administrator was so that there could be more, someone's eyes on that constantly uh, so that we know when those things are, when, when certain funds are going over budget. Um, I think we could talk about that at a future uh, uh, meeting. I, I actually, Mr. Langreck and I were just talking about that when we were setting the agenda, putting the agenda together for today's meeting. Um, but if you wanted to make a motion to amend the motion to amend, <laughs> hopefully that's not too confusing, to uh, pull it from somewhere else rather than the institutional placement funds, say you wanted to dip into the general fund or you want to make a cut in another department, you could you could do that right now and we could discuss that. That would be my amendment because there's no I just don't feel that we're taking we're not going to guarantee that we're going to we're going to do what we're saying we're going to do. So it would have to come out of our general fund the, the, to pay the, for that fifteen thousand. The added four hundred and ninety thousand three hundred and eighty one dollars that we're putting into the placement funds which was built into the preliminary was to try to uh, come up to the where the, the trend is of where we think we're going to be for the placements so cutting into that by fifteen thousand dollars cuts into the estimate uh, of that um, to displace that it, to just add the expense on without taking it from another expenditure would push over all our budget unless we account for it down on the bottom part with um, with our uh, like down by on a line, a line 1026 or a line 1027 out of an undesignated fund spending uh, to try to account for it there to, to keep it balanced. Does that, does that answer your question, Supervisor Cooley? Okay, so I think what we've got here, I'm going to try to restate this and see if I've got it right. So we've got a motion to amend by Supervisor Cooley to um not involve the institutional placement fund and instead to take another fifteen thousand from line one oh two point six which is undesignated fund spending so that would increase 
our dip into the general fund from 80, roughly 88 grand to 103 grand. Did I understand that right? Is that your motion to amend? Or, okay, motion to amend by Cooey. Is there a second to that? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding. So if I'm understanding what Mr. Langrick said, is that he thinks that we budgeted fairly accurately for placements for 2022, so that in theory, if it goes as well as we hope, that we would not overspend that that line item. Thank you. That, that's the intention. You're working with Director uh, Thorson. We identified about a 400 and I'm sorry, I already forgot the number here. Uh, about 490 thousand dollars that historically we've been under budgeting on those uh, placements. So that was included into that on top of, I believe, about a 1.1 in there to bring it up to a little over 1.5 uh, to appropriately account for where we've been trending at. Please correct okay, so, with Director Thorson. So in the past, I would agree with Mr. Cooey's statement. Yeah, we could cut from there, but we're just going to overspend that category anyway. So to be honest, we might as well take it from the general fund. But what it sounds like to me is that we've actually somewhat accurately budgeted for what we should be spending in the placements funds. So taking this fifteen thousand dollars out of there is an is the honest way to, to approach it. That that we we would still not overspend that category. That's the intent. At the same time, the reasoning delivered um, from Ingrid and from Tracy today was the the mindset that. Uh, because we're having the drug court, potentially we have less burden on placements with 50 and 51 uh, by not having any emergency uh, detentions regarding to the drugs, if I, if I understood that correctly. So it's one way or another. Um, at the end of the year, it, it, the, end, the end game may be the same as you're either, you either have room in your placements or you're going to be relying on offsetting it through the audit through undesignated uh, general fund balance. Okay, so I'm just going to check again to see if there's a second for the Brewery amendment. I'll second the, I'll second it. Okay, so a second by Brewer. Discussion. Uh, yep, go ahead, Mr. C. Um, Mr. Langberg, in the original motion uh, presented in the information from Ingrid and Tracy is not inconsistent with it is consistent with our original motion that you would that you introduced to us is that right yes they were they were suggesting an increase in expenditure on the uh, for the drug court and then a reduction in expenditure uh, from the placements i have a lot of confidence in the management of human services uh Fifteen thousand dollars out of uh, a total commitment of one point five million is not uh, significant, and uh, it complies with the requirement to balance the budget by finding a place to fund the expenditure of fifteen thousand dollars. So I, I I do not agree or support. Uh, the amendment. As much as I admire Mr. Cooey, know that I he's such a gentleman that I won't incur his wrath. Um, Mr. Langer, who's taking minutes today? I believe I've got Mr. Bell on, and then I'm also taking notes in case we lose connectivity with Mr. Bell. Okay, gotcha. So I'm just going to ask for a roll call on this and all the other amendments, just so we kind of are clear on where. The committee lies on the budget. Um, so, yeah, Supervisor Gentis, did you want to say something? Oh, Mr. Turkey? The only reason why I bring this up is, is there's no way to guarantee that you're going to save $15,000. We're just hoping we're going to save $15,000. That's the only reason why I bring it up. At the end of the day, we're going to spend the money <laughs> whether we put it here or we put it there. It's just the fact of the matter is, is that you can't guarantee it. And this way we can guarantee we know exactly where it came from. That's the only purpose. Well, we also know that the motion is in compliance with our original amendment. Okay, so um, is it going to be Mr. Bell doing the roll call or will it be you? 
Uh, Josh, are you on? Able to communicate back? Otherwise, I will be calling roll, Mr. Chair. Tell me when you're ready. Okay, we're ready, I think. Mr. C. Aye. Oh, is, excuse me. Uh, we're, we're voting on the amendment, right? We're voting on the motion to amend, the motion to amend. <laughs> so this would be Mr. Cooley's amendment. That's what we're voting on right on now. On Mr. Cooley's amendment, I have to vote no. Mr. Turk? No. Mr. Murphy Lopez? No. Ms. Luck? No. Ms. Gentis? No. Mr. Cooley? Yes. Brewer? No. We have six no's, one aye. Okay, so that motion to amend fails. So now we're back to the original motion to amend, um, which is to increase $15,000 for the drug court and decrease $15,000 for institutional placement costs. Any more discussion on that motion to amend? Let's go ahead and take a roll call on that one as well, please. Uh, has someone made the motion? Yes, yes you I, made it. I did. That's right. <laughs> Hey, many, I forget sometimes too. That's okay. Too many motions and amendments here. Just a second, there, Mr. Chair. I'm going to up a You need me to do this, Clint? I was not able to get on just a second ago. Um, I've got this one if you can prep for the next one, Mr. Bell. Okay. Um, okay. So for our next, we're going to do a roll call then on the, in, the initial resolution. Uh, Linda Gentis. This is the initial motion. I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, the initial resolution. Thank you. Uh, Aye. Linda Gentis. Aye. Uh, Sean Murphy Lopez. Aye. Marty Brewer. Aye. Mark Cooley. No. Melissa Luck. Aye. John Seek. Aye. David Turk. Aye. You have five yes, two no. Okay, so that motion to amend passes. So are there any other motions that committee members would like to make regarding the budget? Okay, um, I think hearing none then, um, I think now it would be a Appropriate and you know what? I don't think we we never did make the finalization motion. I'm reading from the cover sheet. So um, we, we need to did we or did we? No, and, and I wasn't looking for that until you've engaged in all your amendments that you want to do. Okay, so yep. I'm looking for a motion to accept the finalized budget with the amendments, direct administration and departments to make adjustments accordingly direct the county clerk to make necessary public posting and present to the Richland County Board for consideration and adoption at its October meeting. I'll make a motion. Okay, motion by Brewer. A second to motion. Second by Seek. Is there any discussion? Let's request for discussion. Yep, Mr. Turk. I have such mixed feelings about this because while I feel our process of budgeting has improved dramatically, the level of information we have is, is far superior to what we've had in the past. The outcome is we're still nibbling around the edges of things and utilizing uh, unsustainable funding sources to get to an answer at the end. Um, we are kicking the can another year on redefining how we deliver services in county government. Looking at the calendar, I'm not sure what a practical alternative to that would be at this point, but it seems that we need to start asking those questions for 2023 real soon if we are in a position to make any significant changes. Um, while the numbers come out in the end, there are two lines of $300,000 that we're injecting. Uh, and I'm all for utilizing found revenue, but that's not a sustainable practice. Um, we have had to do borrowing for certain projects, and I appreciate the reluctance to do that, but when you're dealing with you know, a maximum revenue increase of, what was it? I think it was higher than expected, but still very low in percentage to what our total taxing authority is. We have a fixed capacity to generate kind of revenue that funds a lot of what we do. And the costs of doing those things are not going down. 
uh, between health insurance, employee salaries, and Supervisor Seek was quite correct. We've piggybacked expenditure limitations on the back of employees for a number of years. Um, we have not made any substantial progress in changing the status quo. And so if we don't make, if we, we pass this and play the same game next year, we probably won't win because the circumstances will be different. We need at some point to bite the bullet and start making steps on some of those difficult choices and changes or it's just all going to blow up. Then we get our hand forced on making those changes in ways that we might not have chosen had we had the time to deliberate and consider more carefully. Again, looking at the calendar for this budget, I don't know practically what that would translate into. I share a lot of Sean's frustrations uh, with, with some of the things here, but you know, we, we're getting to time when we gotta have this in place. And it is an effort to get it to balance. So, you know, kudos for the work to get it this far, but we all need to be keenly aware that there are some really hard things ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Turk. Um, I think I'll just go around, just give everyone a chance to speak on this. So I'm just gonna go around the room from left to right. So Supervisor Luck, you're, you're next in my line of vision. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100% with Mr. Turk. I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned at how, how we could sustain this. For example, I mean, it seems to me that we have almost $800,000 that we're using as revenue in this budget, the 300,000 from contingency and the 500,000 from Pi Valley that will not be available next year. At least I don't think so. So how do, so that means next year we have to immediately come up with an $800,000 gap. Is that accurate? With our monies from Pine Valley and stop me if I'm overstepping administrator Rizlo. Um, but as we approach next year, a lot of it's going to depend on obviously the financial climate and the economy as we approach that. Um, we'll be able to have an estimate then on what we can do with that. I would say that the nature with Pine Valley, if we continue to look with them as I believe Supervisor Seep said earlier, like a cash cow, I'm afraid our relationship is uh, much more transitioning with Pine Valley of rather than being kind of the, the overseer of an organization to more of uh, almost like a relationship of being a shareholder. And we're going to be in a position of kind of rather than trying to control their expenditures on what, what they're doing with staff and salaries to saying almost mandating them to have so much money brought forward for profit sharing to come back to us to either use for debt service or for uh, covering our, our expenses for operations. But to get back to the, the main point of um, those are numbers that we'll know as we approach the next budget year on, on how much um, that we can uh, take and how much those impacts uh, or, or felt by Pine Valley. Does that answer your question, Supervisor? Look. So essentially what you're saying is there might be some money from Pine Valley next year. So it, maybe it's not $800,000 between those two numbers, but it's still not gonna be probably be $500,000. If, if it was the status quo and everything lined up next year for Tom as it did this year, then it would be another $500,000. If, if, if every variable was the same, no, well, no, let me back up. I was shaking his head because we had some influxes of some other types of monies that we had offset. Is that what? You have to come up to the microphone. Oh, we had 250 in reserve yet coming into this year. Thank you. Okay. Never mind. Okay. So, and my other, my other just comment is that um, I do think that the strategic planning process is going to be very helpful in getting us to make these decisions. Um, but I do agree that it shouldn't all come down to the strategic planning committee to to try to make those decisions. You know, I mean, it needs to be a countywide effort. Um, but I do think the strategic plan is going to play a vital role in getting us to finally make these hard choices. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. C. I, I happen to have you met uh, on the strategic planning committee. Melissa. Uh, we've been meeting uh, every other week, so I think we've met four times now, three times now. We've been meeting uh, every other week, though, so twice a month. Of course, anyone is welcome to attend those meetings. So. Absolutely. And Mr. Turk's uh, arguments are well stated. I'm sure that he can contribute 
uh, much to our discussion at that strategic planning meeting. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brewer. Uh, this budget process has been perhaps more transparent than we're used to, but still the urgency is there, David. And we just don't have enough time to consider this and get into the, the meat of things as Sean is suggesting. I am loath, loath to pass on additional debt to the next board. And because that means then we're making decisions for the next board. We're taking the decision making out of their hands and we're doing it. Unfortunately, that's where we're at, and I don't see any way that we can get around it. We discovered a few years ago the the necessity of borrowing and paying for capital expenditures on a borrowing basis, and that has worked pretty well for us. Um, unfortunately, we had that tremendous debt already in place, the Pine Valley debt, and the, I remember agonizing over that vote, what was it, seven years ago, Don, I think, and at the time, and I remember the guarantee that was made at that time to all the board members that, well, yes, general revenue and the taxation is going to pay for some of this debt, but Pine Valley is going to pay for a lot of that debt. And then I rationalized that, or it was rationalized to me, that that's going to be their, you know, if they were renting those buildings, for instance, or if they had to build them on their own, then a big amount of their revenue would have to come to pay that. And that, to me, was the rationalization that we could use some of their money. And, and that's exactly what we're doing here. I don't see any problem with it. Cash cow, uh, well, thank, thank goodness it's well run and, and it can be considered a source of revenue. They've been helped out this year by the increased uh, uh, federal and state aid. I mean, that the feds and the state have recognized that they've got, we have problems in that industry uh, maintaining staff, paying people what they have to be paid. So that's helping them. Uh, I, I'm going to. I'm in favor of the budget. I'm a, we hired an administrator to develop a budget for us. I think he's done a great job. No, it's not perfect, but I'm going to vote for it, and I'm I'm all for moving the process forward. And as far as the the tower project goes, Sean, I mean, yeah, that I mean that's a bonding thing. You, we're not going to be able to pay for that out of uh, you know our petty cash fund. I mean that's talking millions of dollars. However, uh, I'm looking at the answer to all of this is we've got to have more help from the state, from the feds, and that is a project that I see falling right in that that bailiwick. That's that is a project that's going to get state and federal help and uh, maybe the infrastructure bill will, will help us so i i know i'm betting on the come there I, my old boss says never bet on the come but uh that's that's the only thing that's the only answer to, to the the ongoing problem okay mr cooey budgeting process is really bad time I've seen this, it was much different than what it is today. We were limited to what you know, we only generate so much revenue and we got so much expenses. I mean, that, that we know all that. We, everybody knows that. I know we've talked, you know, briefly it's come up as, well, does it force your hand at a, at a referendum at some point? Well, it may. School districts do it on a pretty religious basis to operate their school district. Isn't really probably the best way to look at it, but it puts the it 
gives the, the taxpayer the opportunity to say either you get better or you get you, you, we're going to help and you know that's something that we may have to think about going forward it's probably not the easiest thing to talk about but it is something that if you don't get state aid and you don't get federal money you got to get money from somewhere or you have to cut services and when you put that all out on out for everybody to see they're going to tell you whether they want you to cut services. I think it is it is needed to have their help in deciding what we call or what we do as a county. So, I'm not saying we're going to go for a referendum, but I'm saying we we're it's real easy to see that we can't continue to do what we're doing right now and hope that we make money at Pine Valley or somewhere else. Um, but I will say, as far as being transparent, being able to see everything, looking at everything, it, it's it's a great, great improvement. So, okay, thank you, Supervisor Gentis. Yes, uh, my own. Okay. I'm going to echo pretty much what everyone else has said. I mean, we have to either decide we're going to cut services or not. But the real problem here is. In the last 20 and especially the last 10 years the state legislature has not increased any taxes and has not has reduced funding to the county what in essence it makes us look and do is that we become the bad guys there's no other way around it and if people say which i've heard here i don't want to be the one that says no new taxes or no reference I don't care if I'm not reelected for it, but if I feel that we need to have a good sheriff's department, we need our roads, we need Pine Valley, we need our basic mandated services, especially of health and human services, I'm for raising taxes in a referendum, and I not care if I'm putting out there and saying that. It's difficult to balance a budget and have this and have people have a decent salary so that they can have a living and not be nervous because we have a very high rate of health insurance usage and I'm not quite sure why that is and I worry that we're not promoting some better health within our employees so I'm going to vote for the budget and I know that there's a lot of things that maybe could be trimmed in little places that we could but I think that we have to as a group start lobbying better Start really talking to our representatives and not just being polite with them to say we're tired of our having to take it on the back and that they're saying they're great because they're balancing budget, but they're really passing on all the problems to us. That's what I feel. Okay, thank you. Um, I think in the interest of moving on, we should probably go ahead and take a vote on this. So if we could do a roll call on Motion to accept the finalized budget with that one amendment. Mr. Chairman, I thought you were going around the table. I was. I reached the end of the table. Everyone got a chance. I think I spoke enough already <laughs> before, so I'm going to save anything else. <laughs> but thank you for um, it, it was really interesting, I think, to hear everyone's perspectives. And so I, I really appreciate hearing that as as a member of this body and as the chair of, of this committee, very, very helpful. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. So whenever, okay, um, you're looking for a roll call vote then to finalize the budget? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bell, are you on or otherwise I can initiate? Yes, I am. Okay, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead, Mr. Bell. All right, Supervisor Luck. Yes. Supervisor Seep. Aye. Supervisor Turk. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I said no. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Gentis. Aye. Supervisor Cooey. Aye. Supervisor Brewer, is he still around? And Supervisor Murphy Lopez. No. Four yeses, two noes. 
Okay, so the motion as amended passes. Um, so this will now go on to the county board and then all the steps in between to make it happen as well. So thank you everyone for your attention and your discussion on this. Um, now we need to pick back off the table uh, the radio tower project. So here we already had a motion from Brewer and a second from somebody else. And we I'm just going to what we need to have a motion to bring it back. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can I get a motion to how do you say that? Pick it back. Bring it back from the table. Bring it back from the table. Right. I'll make the motion. Okay, motion by Cooey. Second. second. Motion to remove from the table. Okay, second by seat. All those in favor of bringing it back from the table, please say aye. 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 Those say no. Okay, now we can now we can pick this back up. Thanks for the parliamentary procedure reminder. I I, I appreciate that. Um, so what's before us is and what's already been made is a motion to recommend pursuing the 95% portable in-building radio coverage goals RFP. This resolution will show the county board's commitment to support the bonding needed for this project. So one question I have is, do we have a resolution that will then move forward to the county board, committing the county board, or is this just this committee? <laughs> Yes, we have a resolution prepared. I can pull it up here. Second, Mr. Chair. You're looking for a motion? Nope, it's already been made. Um, I just was looking for clarification to understand if, if um, we're recommending a resolution to the county board or not. It sounds like we are, and then. Yep. The, got the, the resolution right up here. Yes, I do. Yep. And I can you can hear my nasally voice. Otherwise, it is out there. If you want me to just scroll down through it, if there's any questions. Um, would you just be able to, uh, from my perspective, can you just add this to the um, meeting materials after the meeting? Um, I'm I'm fine. I don't need to read it right now myself, but I think it'd be helpful that if we okay. add it. Yep, we can add it to the file and then be fine. Okay. Okay. I apologize for not getting into tax time. But. No, no worries. That's understandable. You did a lot for today. Um, so any discussion on this? So, uh, just to clarify then, I guess maybe I'll read just the bottom part. So okay. what you're looking for is now therefore be it resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that the specification designed for the radio tower project shall meet the 95-95 coverage recommended by True North Consulting and Law Enforcement and Judiciary Committee and be it further resolved the County Board understands that initiation the, initiating the release uh, of this request for proposals is a commitment to future debt services in order to complete the project. Okay. Um, and no more discussion on this. Um, let's go ahead and take a roll call on this one as well. I'm sorry. I, yep. I'm sorry. I have a question. Pleasure. Not, go for it. Uh, clarification. Um, on that last now therefore, or the now therefore be it resolved paragraph, I'm wondering if we also might want to add that the 9595 is the industry standard. I'm not sure if that's exactly the right terminology, but um, that is what I, if, and I guess if Mr. Day is still on or if, um, or MIS director is there, they could correct me, but I believe that it is the, the recommended standard or industry standard or whatever the terminology be, because I think that's important as well. It isn't just us coming up with some numbers. Uh, this is Sheriff Porter, and yeah, that I believe is the recommended standard for public safety. Okay, so I guess I'm making a motion to amend to add one, one line or you know a couple words in that paragraph. Okay, so could you state your motion to amend? What? what yeah. Would you'd insert the words. So I would say that shall meet the industry or recommended standard of ninety-five ninety or. Public safety industry standard of 9595 coverage recommended by True North. Okay, so you'd be inserting the words public safety standard of? I think that's the best way, but I. Any I'm other suggestions discussion. from? This is, this is Mr. Day. I, I would, I think that's correct. The, the way you stated it, the uh, public safety industry standard 9595. Okay. So that's my motion. So okay. it would read, now, there, bear, now therefore be it resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that the spe specification designed for the radio tower project shall meet the public safety standard 
9595 coverage recommended by True North Consulting and the LEJC committee. Okay, so we got motion to amend by Luck and a second by Turk. Any discussion on that motion to amend? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay, that motion to amend passes. So now we have an amended motion before us, and I was asking if a roll call could be taken on this one as well. Yeah, so are you guys ready? I, we need a clarification. Can you speak into the microphone? Yeah, just one more clarification on the amendment. Well, the amendment already passed. Yeah. But do you mean, um, do you need a clarification on the motion? Uh, the, the motion is to recommend pursuing um, the 95. Yes. Um, and the motion also says this resolution will show the county board's commitment, which implies this is going to the county board. So this is going to the county board. Exactly. Okay, so uh, Mr. Bell, if you could go ahead and take the do a roll call, please. All right. Supervisor Seep. Aye. Supervisor Luck. Aye. Supervisor Cooey. Aye. Supervisor Turk. Aye. Supervisor Gentis. Aye. And Supervisor Murphy Lopez. Aye. And all eyes. Okay, so that motion passes. That will be going forward to the county board. Um, so next on our agenda here is. Number 12, amendments to ordinance regarding administration return to union sheriff's office. Who will be taking this one? I'm Mike Kenna, Sheriff Porter's not on. A motion to approve resolution offering job protection to the, the appointed sheriff for a period of two years to return to his prior position in the event he is not elected uh, for the next term. Background on this item in 1996, ordinance 96.2 was written to protect newly appointed Sheriff Daryl uh, uh, Berglund. 96.2 was an amendment to the sheriff's ordinance 89-7. It allowed Sheriff uh, Berglund protection to return to his prior position of lieutenant for up to three years. In 1996, that was the remainder of his existing term plus one additional term. It granted him an unpaid leave of absence from the position of lieutenant. A proposing similar ordinance amendment of 89-7, only changing section four of the ordinance, which covers the sheriff deputy position. Myself and LAGC are recommending the protection last for two years to get past the start of the next term. The wording is very similar between this post ordinance of 96.2. Uh, I added the language, and this is coming from the sheriff, uh, to be clear that I wanted to protect my earned benefit time, sick leave balance, which may not uh, be needed due to a leave of absence. And then attached in the folder um, is the amendment in here. The language is uh, put in here. I would defer to Sheriff Porter or potentially Supervisor Luck uh, for the specified details on this. It's my understanding that general terms this protects in the event that if Sheriff Porter were to lose an election that he could essentially shift down into a lieutenant position. The other ordinance also captures though that a lieutenant can then uh, return back to the union so that he would have the ability to come back into the union. Um, and my understanding with LAJC is Sheriff Porter returning as a deputy is still a fine law enforcement officer. And if we can keep him in the ranks, then that is seen as a benefit to the county. Mr. Chair. Okay, so we've got a motion to, um, uh, or I'm looking for a motion to amend. I will, uh, ordinance. I will make the motion to amend. And after a second, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Luck a question. Okay, so motion by Seep and a second by Turk. Go ahead, Mr. Seep. Uh, Supervisor Luck, uh, I presume uh, this proposal, this amendment is uh, totally supported by unanimously by the Sheriff's Committee, the L Law Enforcement Committee. That is correct. Fine. Okay, any other discussion? I have one question. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, so someone has been hired to replace him. So when he goes back to that, then someone would be relieved of their position. Well, they won't be hired. It's an election. No. Um, she's talking about the chief deputy position. Oh. I, do you want me to speak on that? Sure. So the, 
the chief deputy position is actually appointed by the sheriff by statute. Oh, um, so, so actually what this, what this, what this ordinance is really talking about is, yes, he has the right to go back to his chief deputy position, but if the new sheriff doesn't want him as chief deputy, this would actually send him back to his previous position, which was road patrol sergeant. Um, so it, it, it would displace the chief deputy that's that's currently there, but he may get displaced anyway by a new sheriff. So, I mean, it, the chief deputy is a little bit of a complicated position because it is appointed by the sheriff. Um, but my understanding when, because we did have concerns about that is that you're, you're bumping someone back, but, um, and we did talk about that in committee and, um, the the general consensus we got from the the sheriff's deputies was that they under when they take these positions they understand that this possibility exists that the person who they're replacing could come back into that position and um and everyone it understands that that's that's a possibility Ms. luck is correct oh Mr. sheriff porter is on he may be able to expound on that more accurately yeah, and and so and you hit you hit it right, Melissa. It, what what this is is offering me a, basically an un, unpaid leave of absence from my position of chief deputy, which gives me certain protections both by county ordinance and state statute. Um, and with those protections, if if either, I guess basically it'd be by the sheriff's choice, an incoming sheriff's choice. If he didn't choose to keep me as chief deputy, then I would return to my prior position as patrol sergeant. Um, you know, there is some complications with that. Uh, if, if there's not a vacancy in the patrol sergeant position that somebody could be displaced, uh, you know, and, and also it, it, it's not, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibilities that a, a sheriff could come in and decide he doesn't want me as his chief deputy and he doesn't want my chief deputy as his chief deputy, in which case, uh, I, I'll have to say it, that would be the possibility we'd have to find two positions. Uh, I don't think that's very likely. Uh, however, it is a possibility um, and I should be upfront with that. The um, other side of this too is, is although I would like to fill this position, uh, we do have that position that hasn't been filled since 2009, I believe uh, that that, you know, so there is, in a sense, an opening that hasn't been filled in the department for quite some time. Uh, probably not the way we were looking to fill it, but it does exist. Mr. Chairman. Okay, yeah, Mr. C. Yes, Ms. Uh, Luck is correct. The, the chief deputy is always served at the pleasure of the sheriff, unless, of course, he serves at the displeasure. Um, Fully support this. Okay, is there anyone else who wants to speak on this? Okay, then all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. That motion passes. Thank you, Sheriff, for, for being here. Thank you. Uh, item number 13, request for leave of absence exception ambulance service. Sir Langer. Mr. Chair, looking today for motion to consider reimbursement of an employee for additional health insurance costs deducted from a paycheck because of pre approved week off without pay. A, uh, ambulance emergency technician requested pre scheduled one week off without pay for a trip in August of 2021 that was already scheduled and paid for when being interviewed for a full time position. The time off without pay was agreed to, and the employee accepted the offer of full time position. His scheduled trip was about a month before he earned vacation time, and because he did not have vacation time to cover the pre approved time off, the employee had to pay $329.20 deducted from his. Uh, from his paycheck to pay towards the county's portion of the health insurance. This is on top of his already paid monthly deduction of $194.47. It should be also be noted that a month of August, he worked 107.5 hours for an average of 42 hours per week with one week off without pay. So this is brought forward uh, to, to do this. Our, our handbook says that for an employee uh, to go on to an unpaid leave of absence, requires 100% premium. The expectation with the department kind of extended this offer um, was that premiums would still be covered if I'm saying that correctly, Director Gutchin. Um, so we're looking to see if we're willing to make an exception to a, 
allow for the county to reimburse for the 100% premium contribution that was required, required of that employee during the one week leave of absence. Did I say that correctly? Okay, does anyone want to make that motion? I'll move. Motion by Turk. Well, second. Second by Cooley. Not hearing any discussion. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. That motion carries. Agenda item number 14, future agenda items. Supervisor Gentis, do you have anything? Not today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking care of these things as they come up. Okay, Mr. Cooley. Uh, okay. I, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Langwick for all of his due diligence, his very hard work, and his professionalism in bringing this budget matter for us. We're surely indebted to him for us fine work that he's done. And I also want to thank the chair for his excellent work leading this meeting process. Absolutely. Happy to do it. I like it. Um, Supervisor Law. I'm, I'm just wondering if we could possibly have an agenda item, and I don't know if it needs to be the immediate near future or what, but where we give specific instructions before the budget process starts, where we give specific instructions to our county administrator, for example, to say, we don't want to dip into these particular funds in order to cover any gaps and, you know, to start from that point instead of the preliminary budget, having those already put in there. So, anyway, that's, I don't know if it's now or what, but, you know, I don't, the, the comment that we don't have time to change it now. I mean, we started so much earlier and here we are again, where we're, we're at a budget where we're kind of have no choice, but to accept it, even though it's not quite sitting right. So that, that I would say that maybe just January, we need to have a serious conversation about what kind of instructions we want to give for the next budget development. Okay. Understood. Supervisor Turk. No, nothing at this time. Okay, so that takes us to number 15 adjournment. So I'm looking for a motion to adjourn to Tuesday, October 5th at 1 p.m. Not in the county boardroom because this is needed for uh, uh, a jury trial, um, but I'm assuming in the health and human services conference room. Is that right? Or do you need to check on that? I'll have to check on that if we can. Uh, okay, we'll adjourn to that location unknown. Okay, thank unknown you. Unknown location. No, so moved. Okay, motion by Gentis. Second by Turk. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Hi. Hey, we're adjourned. Thanks, everyone.